Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, let's go ahead and get started. Welcome to the briefing, the PV23 briefing for the Missile Defense Agency. Uh, to my left is the director of the Missile Defense Agency, Vice Admiral John Hill. To his left is the Missile Defense Agency comptroller, Ms. Didi Martinez. Once the presentation is complete uh, this afternoon, we will have time for questions, of course. Please. Uh, Identify yourself and try to limit yourselves to one question with one follow-up. Do your best. <laughs> I know that's hard. Three, four in a row. Please try and keep it to one if you can, and then a follow-up if you can. It'll just be easier on our uh, on our briefers today. And uh, with that, I will turn it over to Vice Admiral Hill for his opening remarks, and we'll get started. Okay. Yeah. Great. Uh, th thanks, Mark. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, thanks for uh, the time today. Um, I'm uh, really here to uh, represent uh, our team. Uh, we call ourselves a stellar team uh, with a noble mission. You, know, you wake up every morning, uh, and if you work for the Missile Defense Agency, you know exactly what you're uh, focused on. And what we're focused on today is dealing with a very formidable and evolving threat. And so every penny that we're spending in the 23 budget is focused on how we uh, deal with those threats across a multiple uh, you know, set of, uh, of interesting uh, scenarios. Um, so we're, we're going to talk to you about where those investment areas are, and I'm going to turn it over to our great uh, comptroller, uh, Ms. Didi Martinez. Didi. Thank you, Admiral. Good afternoon, everyone. I appreciate the opportunity to, to brief you today on the Missile Defense Agency's FY23 budget request. Next chart, please. In 2004, the United States activated the Ballistic Missile Defense System for the first time to defend the U.S. homeland against limited ballistic missile attack from nations such as North Korea and Iran. Since then, the threats posed by both ballistic and non-ballistic missile systems have increased in both numbers and complexity. The missile defense system that the nation has deployed today addresses the current missile threat and consists of a robust sensor network, ground-based interceptors for homeland defense, and for regional defense, we have interceptors deployed on Aegis ships, at Aegis ashore in Romania, and in THAAD and Patriot batteries deployed worldwide. These assets are all linked together by our Command and Control, Battle Management and Communications, or C2BMC system. However, the threat is changing at a rapid pace, and we must continue to invest in system upgrades and new technology to keep pace. Ballistic missiles are now more sophisticated and numerous. They are becoming more mobile, survivable, reliable, and accurate, and can achieve longer ranges. New ballistic missile systems also feature multiple and maneuverable reentry vehicles, along with decoys and jamming devices. The homeland must also defend, be defended from cruise missile attacks. The cruise missile threat is also increasing in sophistication and lethality. Cruise missiles follow unpredictable flight paths and are now capable of supersonic and hypersonic speeds. Russia and China are developing advanced cruise missiles that can be launched from aircraft, ground launchers, and ships or submarines, along with hypersonic missile capabilities. Hypersonic missiles pose a new challenge to our missile defense systems. These threats can travel at exceptional speeds and unpredictable flight paths. The development and deployment of missile defense systems to counter these advanced threats presents unique but surmountable challenges which require further development and technology investments. As I will highlight, the Missile Defense Agency's FY23 budget request includes key investments to address these challenges. Next chart, please. The Missile Defense Agency mission is to develop and deploy a layered missile defense system to defend the United States, its deployed forces, allies, and friends from missile attacks in all phases of flight. As I've discussed, the need to invest in new capability development and advanced technologies to improve our missile defense systems is critical. We must also continue to operate and maintain our fielded systems to the highest level of system readiness and reliability and continue to produce and field missile defense capacity, including delivery of additional interceptors and radars. The balance between current and future capability is required to meet warfighter demand and our FY23 budget request reflects this commitment. Next chart, please. Our total request of $9.6 billion in FY23 strengthens and expands the deployment of defenses against increasingly capable missile threats. Our request, of our request, $7.9 billion, or 82% of our budget is for research and development efforts. This budget reflects the best balance of resources to priorities and program risk. Next chart, please. 
The next few charts will go over the details of our FY23 request, but first, here are a few of the highlights. As with every budget request, our FY23 request maintains the operations and readiness of deployed missile defense systems to include our sensor network, homeland and regional interceptors, and C2BMC system. In FY23, we will launch two prototype hypersonic and ballistic tracking space sensors for on-orbit experimentations in conjunction with the U.S. Space Force and the Space Development Agency. We continue to fund two next-generation interceptor industry teams through the Critical Design Review. We awarded two contracts last year for this important homeland defense program, and development is ramping up in FY23. We also continue the GMD Service Life Extension Program for GBIs to increase system reliability prior to NGI fielding. I spoke earlier of the hypersonic threat, and this budget continues development of a regional hypersonic defense glide phase intercept capability to address that threat. We are continuing efforts to improve the defense of Guam against the full spectrum of advanced regional missile threats. This request also continues production and fielding of missile defense capability and production of additional SM-3 Block 1B and 2A missiles for the Navy and THAAD interceptors for the Army. The next set of charts will address some of the specific budget line items in our FY23 budget request. The charts are in order of the missile defense system battle sequence, detect, control, and engage. Next chart, please. MDA initiated the Hypersonic and Ballistic Tracking Space Sensor, or HBTSS, program in 2018 to address the requirement to detect and track hypersonic threats and ballistic missiles. MDA is collaborating with the U.S. Space Force and the Space Development Agency to deploy a system that will provide a rapid capability using mature technology and operate as an element within the larger unified overhead persistent infrared enterprise architecture. The program will provide fire control quality tracking data on hypersonic threats for handover to missile defense sensors and engagement by missile defense weapons. The FY23 request for HBTSS is $89 million and will support the deployment of two satellites in FY23 with on-orbit experimentations to follow. The space-based kill assessment, or SCA, sensors were launched and an on-orbit checkout was completed in 2019. The SCA sensors have performed successfully during several recent MDA flight tests, further demonstrating the hit assessment capability to the warfighter. The SCA request is $27 million to continue integration of this capability into the MDS. We are developing, deploying, and sustaining ground-based radars to counter current and future missile threats, build warfighter confidence, and increase force structure. Our FY23 request includes 504 million to upgrade and sustain the 12 Tippy 2 radars, with the 13th radar being procured with FY21 funds from Congress. 75 million for the Long Range Discrimination Radar, or LRDR, in Alaska. This advanced radar achieved initial fielding in December of 2021 and is a critical mid course sensor that improves missile defense system threat discrimination capability and also allows for a more efficient use of the ground based mid course defense system. 165 million for the sea-based X-band radar or SBX to provide precision mid-course tracking and threat discrimination to protect our homeland. Our FY23 request continues operations and support for this critical radar. 20 million to sustain and provide updates to the upgraded early warning radars or UEWRs and continue to sustain the Cobra Dane radar in partnership with the US Air Force. C2BMC is the integrating element of our missile defense system. Our FY23 request of 569 million sustains the fielded C2BMC capability across 18 time zones with hardened networks supporting all of the combatant commands. Our request also integrates new capabilities such as the recently fielded LRDR into the C2BMC system. Next chart, please. The department is committed to improving US homeland missile defenses. The ground-based mid-course defense system, or GMD, serves as the continuously available homeland missile defense capability for defending against today's rogue state ballistic missile threats. The request for GMD is $2.8 billion. The request sustains and improves the performance, reliability, availability, and cybersecurity resiliency of the GMD weapon system throughout the fight. The request upgrades homeland defense system capabilities, including ground-based interceptors, ground systems, and phased array GBI communication terminal kits, 
and improves com components of the agency's GMD system, including GBIs, fire control nodes, communication systems, launch systems, and infrastructure to pace rogue nation threats to the homeland, and initiates ground weapon system capability improvements to integrate NGI. The request continues funding for two NGI industry teams through the critical design review. This plan reduces technical risk in meeting common requirements and advanced threats, secures competitive production pricing, and creates incentives for early delivery to the warfighter, which is one of their top priorities. The NGI development will provide a more capable, robust, all-up-round solution to meet the emerging threat, improve system survivability, and increase performance against projected threats from rogue states. The Aegis Missile Defense request is $1.6 billion and continues to upgrade the Aegis weapon system and procure additional missiles. 47 Aegis SM-3 Block 1B missiles and 10 SM-3 Block 2A missiles will be procured for deployment on land at the two Aegis Ashore sites in Europe and at sea on multi-mission capable Aegis ships. Our request continues the multi-year procurement for the SM-3 Block 1B missile. We will continue to develop and implement Aegis weapon system upgrades to support the Navy's newest destroyers with the new SPY-6 radar, as well as upgrade sensors on the older ships in the Aegis fleet. The THAAD weapon system is a globally transportable, ground-based missile defense system, which is highly effective against short-range, medium-range, and intermediate-range threats. As you know, the UAE has acquired THAAD batteries through foreign military sales and recently had the first successful com combat engagements of the system. The FY23 THAAD request is $422 million. In FY23, we will procure three THAAD interceptors while increasing obsolescence and stockpile reliability to extend in-service interceptor life. We will also continue development and integration of multiple THAAD software builds to improve readiness, reliability and availability, and enhance capability against global operational threats, address the evolving threat, improve the warfighter's defense planning, and improve system capability. Our FY23 budget request includes funding to continue testing of THAAD and Patriot interoperability to improve the overall missile defense capability and increase the defended area. FTT25 is a key FY23 test of this capability. Current forces are capable of defending Guam against today's North Korean ballistic missile threats. However, the regional threat to Guam, including from China, continues to rapidly evolve. At the request of Indo-PACOM, the FY22 budget included funds to begin system architecture work and procurement for enhanced defense of Guam. The architecture has now been finalized and includes a combination of integrated MDA, Army, and Navy components. The FY23 MDA request for Defense of Guam is $539 million and continues the architecture work but also provides funds for design and development of multiple land-based radar systems, procurement of weapon system components, and initiates MILCON planning and design activities. Next chart, please. As always, we are looking to develop new technologies to keep pace with the threat. Our FY23 budget request includes $39 million to continue our innovation, science, and technology program, to explore leap ahead and disruptive technologies, and also develop emerging capabilities to enhance our missile defenses. We are requesting $563 million for systems engineering to continue to provide critical products and processes needed to combine element missile defense capabilities into a single, integrated, and layered system. Testing is a critical aspect of the Missile Defense Agency mission. Validating system performance through flight and ground test is paramount to building warfighter confidence in our system. To that end, our FY23 request includes $361 million for flight, ground, and cybersecurity testing, and $560 million for development of threat representative targets used during testing. FY23 test highlights include FTG-12, a GMD test of a GBI in two-stage mode, and a THAAD Patriot MSC interoperability test, FTT25. We are continuing to develop and deliver a regional hypersonic defense capability to the warfighter. We are developing a glide phase intercept capability for future demonstration, leveraging our existing missile defense systems. The request for hypersonic defense is $225 million. Our FY23 request includes $11 million to continue to develop the systems architecture 
and to conduct a demonstration for cruise missile defense capabilities using the joint tactical integrated fire control capability. This is in response to U.S. NORTHCOM's requirements for cruise missile defense of the homeland. MDA and is the Israel Missile Defense Organization continue to cooperate on engineering, development, co-production, testing, and fielding of the Israeli missile defense systems. The FY23 request of $500 million remains consistent with the Memorandum of Understanding between the United States and Israel. Next chart, please. In summary, we are requesting $9.6 billion in FY23. Our request aligns with department priorities to defend the homeland and deter attacks. This budget will continue to increase the readiness, capability, and capacity of fielded homeland and regional missile defense systems. It also invests in advanced technology and development to counter the expanding threat. The FY23 request launches prototype hypersonic and ballistic tracking space sensors for an on-orbit experiment in conjunction with the U.S. Space Force and SDA, continues development of the next generation interceptor, procures SN3 Block 1B and 2A missiles and THAAD interceptors for our warfighters, continues to execute a robust and aggressive test program, continues development of hypersonic defenses including regional glide phase interceptor development, and continues to enhance defense of Guam in coordination with the services and Indo-PACOM. Thank you. The Admiral and I will now take a few questions. Well, the, the Guam architecture, you said Army and Navy elements. Um, can you say if that includes Aegis Ashore uh, or what elements there are? But if it, it does include Aegis Ashore, who would be manning it, the Navy or the Army? Great, great, great question. Uh, the architecture on Guam will be a mix of those systems. So think of that as MDA systems, uh, uh, Army uh, systems, and uh, uh, Navy uh, systems. Uh, it will not be an Aegis Ashore. Uh, think of it as a distributed system, uh, because we do. We're going to respond to the number one requirement of 360 de degree coverage against uh, uh, ballistic uh, cruise and hypersonic threats. Then. So Army would be Patriot, THAAD, oh, sorry, 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 uh, Patriot uh, MDA would be THAAD, Navy would be SM-6, or? So, so uh, MDA would be uh, the uh, ballistic missile portion of Aegis. We work that in coordination with the Navy. So uh, for procurement of some of those uh, equipment suites that you would need, uh, that's our coordination with the Navy. Um, it'll include uh, SM-3 uh, missiles, uh, SM-6 missiles, and then uh, Army will be connecting to them uh, through their IBCS uh, system. So um, THAAD will uh, right now stay on the island. Uh, the current architecture right now is Aegis ships and THAAD. Uh, so we're going to build upon that architecture, uh, leveraging uh, Aegis uh, command and control weapons, IBCS command and control and weapons. Jen, please. Um, just to, to pile on that, um, would using a mid-range capability missile as the launcher be something that you would consider um, down the road? Um, and also, what about certain things like Army Army's radar, the LTAM's radar that? should be coming a lot online. Yeah, How absolutely. are you looking at incorporating those future capabilities? Yeah, we assessed uh, you know, all of those uh, areas, particularly the ones that were the most mature and the most capable today across those mission sets. Uh, so so you will see uh, heavy interest uh, in mobile mobile launchers. So when we talk about distributed systems, it is about uh, being as mobile as possible. So you're going to see a distributed system that is mobile. Tony. I'm going to span the global, uh, globe a little bit, span the globe a little bit. Sure. The Polish uh, Aegis Ashore system, given that Europe's uh, topical, four years late, is it going to get, uh, is it going to be operational this year? Yeah, uh, it, it, uh, it's, it's tracking along really well. Um, uh, you know, where we were, I think, over the last two to three years, uh, the issue has been uh, with the construction side of it. It's, it's like shipbuilding. If you're, if you're late on uh, the, the ship, you're going to be late on getting the combat system installed and tested. Uh, we, uh, in very close coordination with the Army Corps, uh, have, have gotten to the point where we've got a very predictable schedule now. Um, so we've got the arrays in place. Uh, all of the Aegis equipment uh, for the warfighting uh, capability to shore now installed. It's all in place, and uh, we start our testing uh, campaign on the combat system uh, coming up uh, this next month. When do you uh, think it may be considered fully operational, your version of the FUE? 
Yeah, yeah. so I, I typically don't like to do that when we don't have, uh, you know, that confident schedule, you know, in the rear view mirror. Uh, that's kind of a new thing. Uh, plus, we have a lot of wickets to go through. There's going to be the technical capability declaration on the MDA side. Then we have to do Navy acceptance. Then we do European Command acceptance and then NATO acceptance. So all of those have their own schedules. We're, we're working very closely across all those entities uh, so that we can get there as soon as we can. Okay. North Korea question. I'm not going to ask you whether the, the launch last week was an indication of an ICB. But I do want to ask you this. What is your assessment, as the man whose agency is in charge of the missiles to defend the United States, what's your assessment of North Korea's countermeasures capability at this point? It's always been a sticking point with the arms control community. Yeah. So, so I'm not in charge of uh, that capability once it's deployed. We certainly uh, develop it and we provide it to, to the services to meet the command command's uh, requirements. Um, you're really asking more of an intel uh, question, uh, but I, I would say that uh, they are advancing, uh, and that's what you're seeing around the globe. You know, you said you're going to walk around the globe here. I tell you, the, the evolving threat is coming from many axes, and it's coming in all forms, whether it's air launch, submarine launched, uh, ballistic launched, cruise missile launched, hypersonic. Uh, that's what we're dealing with uh, as a deployment. Department, along with our allies and partners. It, it's, it's a tough place to be. Um, but I, I would say that uh, enough of that technology uh, is proliferating to where we have to address it. But is North Korea, is they're advancing in their countermeasures capability over the last two or three years? Or That's a better question for the intel community. I can give you a qualitative answer, but I'm, I'm not going to talk about details here. Okay, I want to ask you then on the uh, General Selva, the vice chief of the staff a few years ago, in 2019, as he was leaving, yeah. said North Korea has not perfected a reentry vehicle, the arming guidance and timing that a nuclear weapon would have to have on an ICBM, and nor the, the, the RV that would uh, be able to carry the warhead. Fast forward three years, is that still the case? Because the world's fixated on the range of the, of the missile, but not the, the tip of the spear, so to speak. Right. Uh, the vice chairman at the time, I, I think, gave a very fair assessment uh, that was based uh, and rooted in the intelligence that we had at the time. And you remember there was a pause in uh, testing, right? So, so now, now they're testing again. Um, so they are making progress, uh, but in terms of details of reentry and survivability, uh, I can't really speak to that today. More of an intel question. Thank you. Let's uh, I'll come to right after. Uh, let's go to uh, the Zoom line and uh, ask uh, Jason Sherman to uh, go ahead and uh, field his question. Jason, are you there? Yes, thank you. I have a question about uh, the Guam defense system and also the missile defense review. Um, Admiral, uh, your budget uh, is seeking $539 million. DOD says the total amount is 892 Can you tell us... Uh, where uh, the balance of those funds would be, and also the Indo-PACOM had been very vocal about needing that capability by 2026. Does this budget, uh, you know, keep the department on track uh, to deliver a um, um, in Aegis, well, uh, uh, a new air missile defense system um, to the island by 2026? Yeah, Jason, uh, thanks. Uh, great, great question. Um, I would say that the work that the department has done over the last uh, couple years, working very closely with Indo-PACOM, you know, in terms of leaning forward, even in the 22 budget, uh, we laid down where we would prioritize, not knowing what the final architecture would be, which is really in the in the 23 budget. It's 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 what we uh, discussed a little bit earlier today. Um, so we're going to do everything uh, that we can uh, to meet that timeline. Um, you know, the the requirement from the combatant command is clear. Timelines are uh, clear. Uh, um, which is why we went with the more mature technologies, and I'm not talking a lot about new things I hear today. We're going to leverage what we have with Aegis Fire Control, what we have with IBCS, where we are with SM3 missiles, SM6, sea-based terminal, uh, and uh, THAAD and Patriot. Uh, so I think we're on a good path. It's going to be hard, though, if you were to ask me what the hardest things are in the Missile Defense Agency. I would say we've got to keep uh, NGI on track. We're doing very well with the GBIs uh, in the ground today. We have the Service Life Extension Program, which will keep those missiles around for a long time. We just placed one of the refurb missiles, which is great. We're getting ready to emplace the second one. I would have I told you it was done today, but we had some wind issues up there now. Uh, so we're, we're, we're rock solid there. That is the focus of this agency, uh, Homeland Ballistic Missile Defense. And when I think about level of difficulty, it will be Guam. Well, we just had a team uh, return. You probably know that there is a small percentage of the land that is available for us to land this, uh, this capability. Uh, so we're going to stay very close uh, to the Joint uh, Regional Command there for land allocations and siting. 
building. And when you think about mobility, uh, that means a lot of gear going onto the land. And so right now it's just moving as fast as we can with the most mature technology, prioritize those things that we need to buy now, prioritize those engineering studies to, uh, to integrate and pull them together. Uh, and uh, we're, we're, gonna, we're gonna get pretty doggone close uh, to that timeline. But I will know more once we finish the, uh, the work that we have to do on the architecture and the actual footprint and where things are gonna go. So that, that is work that's in front of us. And so I can't say date certain we're gonna hit that timeline, uh, but I can say we're pointing to it and uh, we've got everything aligned to get there. Thank you, Jason. Yes, ma'am, go ahead. Resolutions with breaking defense. Thank you for doing this, sir. Um, my question is on HBTSS, and um, you, you're showing that you're going to launch in the second quarter of FY23 the two prototypes. Can you talk a little bit about what happens then, like when a decision is made and who, who is, is, is the Space Force going to operate these? And um, so what's the timeline for making a decision about whether you go forward with an actual program? Yeah, true said. Thank you. Um, so um, I'll, I'll spell out the acronym first, though, so we, we understand what we're talking about here. Hypersonic Ballistic Tracking Space Sensor. So it is a sensor that we're in close coordination with Space Development Agency and the Space Force to work it into their overall OPIR enterprise. So that will be the big decision for us after 23. We're going to have data available in 23, just like many of the other systems that were discussed today, and then the decisions will be made to, to go forward to proliferate. Um, Right now, uh, going to 23 is taking what we've done on the ground. We really worked hard to de-risk the program. Um, so you've probably heard me talk about uh, some of the ground testing we have done where we have pulled the hot targets off of the warm earth, and that is not easy. Uh, but the companies have performed very well, and we're going to take them into space, uh, in, into that environment, and we're going to pull that data down. We're going to put it in the fire control loop. And, uh, and if we prove to ourselves that this is worth doing, then we'll proliferate. But that will be done as part of the larger OPIR enterprise. And that will be done then at the end of 23? Uh, that timeline's uh, pretty, pretty decent for uh, what we can assume. Um, it's, uh, but yeah, we, we should have uh, data coming down, you know, in the summer of 23 or so, and we'll be able to help the Space Force make decisions. And to answer your, your first question, the Space Force will operate the system. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. I'm, uh, I'm Jerry Bard with the U.S. Journal of Korea. Um, currently, 28,000 U.S. troops in South Korea. Uh, if uh, we withdraw or increase uh, U.S. troops in South Korea. Has any defense budget changed for 23 years? Uh, great question, and I wish I could answer it. Um, I, I don't, uh, don't really know about uh, troop withdrawal and any offsets in the budget. I, it, it's, it has uh, no impact on what we're doing as a development agency of capability. Thank you. Yes, sir. Andrew Robertson with Breaking Defense. Uh, thanks for doing this. Thank so you. Your FY23 MILCON budget request is $47 million, and then your FY24 is $501. Um, what, what investment are you making there that accounts for that $450 million increase? Yeah, that, that would be the MILCON for Guam. Is, is, is that right, Dee? Actually, I believe it's the Ground Test Facility Infrastructure Project oh, okay. as well as Guam. Okay. Thanks. All right, so one of the things we're doing to ensure we can do end-to-end -end testing, and this is hard. I, I grew up in the world where we all wanted to do high-speed end-to-end uh, testing, meaning that you've got a good characterization of the environment, good uh, digital characterization of the radar, characterization of the combat control, characterization of the women, and, and have it all as a string to where we can do thousands of runs and test the full requirement space. Um, in the world that we live in today where we're sneaker netting, uh, you know, uh, uh, data between different systems that are located around. We're trying to co-locate everything, and that's that's what that's about. Thank you, Didi. Please. Sure. Uh, just on the uh, Guam architecture again, um, how does the architecture deal with the issue of cruise missiles, say like a, a swarm attack by CJ-20? Right. Yeah, great, great question. Uh, that's one of the reasons why we have a heavy leverage on IBCS. They, they bring in cruise missile capability. Um, and then we have uh, the way we're going to disperse uh, for our detection capability and our networking is how we're going to deal with that. If on the interceptor side, though, is there any particular ones that's, that's uh, useful for that? Uh, so Patriot's got a fabulous uh, capability for that, and uh, that's that's our, our first focus area, and we have the ability within Aegis to enable that, but right now uh, we are doing ballistic missile hypersonic on the Aegis part of that overall integrated architecture, and then the cruise missile piece uh, will be with the Army systems. 
Tony. Could you talk a little bit about the operational impact if you successfully can demonstrate Fed, Patriot, MSE integration? You've done yeah. a couple tests. I think right. you had one going on. What's the operational impact to like the U.S. forces in Korea, right. South Korean forces, uh, if this if this plays out? Yeah, I'm, I'm really excited about this one. I, I would say it's more interoperability, but it does require you to integrate those systems. So, for instance, the the current test campaign that we're in now uh, allows the Thad battery to control uh, a Patriot launcher. What that provides the combatant command is flexibility, right? So the first test we did was to separate the launchers, right? So what we want to do is to give flexibility again, right? Where you place your launchers really matters, right? So if you need to worry about uh, ports uh, to the south, then you have the ability to, to do that. If you want to move the THAAD battery back, and, and uh, you know, I'll be careful on, on uh, getting in front of the command command what they will do, it just gives them that flexibility. The ability to control a Patriot missile using a THAAD radar, more flexibility. Um, so that's that's really what we're doing, uh, and it's based on very discrete requirements uh, coming from Indo-PACOM. Again, I can language, like, the, the radar can see much farther yes. instead of discrimination. Uh, absolutely, that's and you can take advantage of the kinematics of the Patriot MSE missile. That, that's what it allows okay. you to do. No, well, I got here. Can you preview FTG-12, this two-stage selectable GBI test? Yeah. That'll be all interesting when it happens, but yeah. you translate what it is. So, so we did a boost vehicle test uh, recently, and what that was is, is really, let's, let's just make sure we, we can do the two, three stage uh, capability. And what that means is you don't burn the third stage, so it allows you to handle targets that are coming over you. Right, so it closes battle space up, right? So we're shooting out far normally. And just like we do with Aegis and other staged missiles, if you don't fire the last stage, that allows you to really take care of the fuller battle space. The ones cl coming closer to the United States or the ones right. you can get farther out? Right. It, it gives you a really uh, more of a shoot-look-shoot shoot, uh, capability as, as they come in. So you shoot them far, then you shoot them in closer. And by controlling the staging and, and the burn, uh, you, you can shoot those, those ones that are closer. Okay, thanks. Yeah. He'll have shoot leakers. Jen, please. Um, just to follow up on the Aegis Ashore system in Poland, um, I know that it was somewhat over budget in previous budget briefings. How over budget has the Aegis Ashore system gotten in this process in Poland? Do you, can you, what, what's the number in 23? So in 23, we have uh, 30 million in procurement for, this is all of Aegis Ashore to include Romania and the test site at PMRF. 30 million procurement and 28 million for RDT and E, so 58 million in total. Yeah. So, so that's and and so um, some portion of that uh, is Poland. We we can break that out for you okay, uh, yeah, in I'm another venue. But, of, you know, yeah. What was predicted before all of this? Right. Where we are now. It's <laughs> it's uh, it is very frustrating. Uh, but I tell you, uh, the partnership with the Army Corps has been great, and with the uh, uh, the, the team that's out there doing that construction. Uh, again, we're on a predictable schedule now. All the equipment's in place. We start robust testing uh, here in April, and we're really excited about that. Um, I was pretty stoked when we got the arrays in place because that was a forcing function on, uh, on construction. But now that we have the equipment in place, the sailors are, are on board now because uh, we, we completed the water supply building. So you've got the, uh, the operational team there. You've got the security team there. It's about going to testing now with operators on console. So that's a great place to be. Okay. Just, just to follow up, because um, I get a follow up question. <laughs> uh, what's the timing for the glide phase interceptor um, for hypersonic defense? Um, I know that you said that it was a little bit in limbo, um, you know, as we head into this budgeting process. But can you provide any more fidelity on that? Yeah, you know, I, I thought long and hard about how you give a range of time, you know, that's that's in the future, particularly when you're where we are uh, in GPI, which is we have three, and um, we've taken a uh, other transaction authority approach so that we can bring in the best of what industry has to offer. So we're evaluating those proposals now. So it, it um, I'm not ready to say, uh, you know, what what the end state will look like or what that end game will look like. We know we can move quickly. We know the propulsion capability to get there is just operating in a different environment. So it's all about the front end, and so we, we have to do more work. We're not even at a system requirements review yet. So, you know, stating a, a date certain is really hard uh, at this point. But uh, we can move quickly once we um, finish our evaluation and uh, get into the formal development. Tony, you had a follow-up? On the, uh, the Polish site, the John Wood Company, the United Kingdom group that WPI, was doing it, right. they hadn't been paid, for, they weren't, as of like last year, they hadn't been paid for quite right. a while because of the sh their work was less than optimal. Uh, can you check, and I don't expect you to know this, but can you check to see whether you've resumed payments uh, to we, the well, company? We, we have started to, that, that was part of, uh, when, I, when I say this great coordination with the Army Corps, is that we've been able to use uh, some of those funds to, to stimulate and keep, keep the company moving. 
Um, so, we're, so by the way, um, their their work has always been high quality, right? So, so we're very satisfied with that, and that, that's a good thing. It was just running slow, because there, there's just a lot of complexity with a fully automated system like that, and that's what we're coming through now. So, again, when we go into testing uh, here in April, uh, that's a very positive sign, uh, because typically when you get to an Aegis light off on a ship, you you are in the end game, and so we're, we're there. Are you concerned that the Russians are going to misinterpret this? Uh, remember, this is for Iran, Iranian sure. missiles, but it's always. It, given the environment now, uh, is your messaging going to have to ratchet up to reinforce what this thing is supposed to stop? Yeah, so it's going to—it's it's really policy and UCOM messaging. Um, you know, I know exactly what the technical capability is, and I, I think a lot of the statements that are made are, are just uh, there to get folks spun up. I mean, you—you you know what the capability of SM3 uh, Block 2A is. It is not meant to go after uh, strategic uh, capabilities like Russia would bring. Yes, sir. Thank you, Louis. Please. Sir, um, Secretary Austin recently uh, postponed an ICBM um, in the Minuteman 3 test because he didn't want any miscalculations on the part of the Russians. I mean, have you been received any guidance that any future testing that you may do this year, I don't know if you have anything scheduled, but uh, would, would that, if, if this drags on, could it impact your testing um, given, you know, yeah, so it's a broad question. Um, yeah. It has in the past, all right. So, so what we do is we make sure we're coordinating very closely with the combatant command in that region where we happen to be do, uh, happen to be uh, doing our testing. I make sure I, I run that right up uh, to the national military command, um, and uh, we're doing the same thing with the current uh, test campaign that we're in right now, uh, uh, particularly the political military side. Uh, it is fair for the Secretary of Defense to make those sorts of decisions uh, because of the world that we live in, and so we're open to that. And so part of our test planning includes uh, over communicating on what we're doing and, you know, I'm not the expert on saying if it's going to have a policy impact or if it's going to have some concern around the globe. Um, so uh, if I'm told to, to back off or delay or change, we, we will do that. It's just a normal, normal part of uh, doing this business. I've been doing it for a long time and uh, sometimes you have to be you have to be, we have to be concerned about political military uh, concerns all the time. And so if we have to adjust, we'll adjust. Does that mean that you would slide to the right whatever yes. the program that you have? Yes. And we've done that before. Right? So it's not new. Okay, oh, yeah, please. Um, on the cruise missile test architecture that you spoke to, uh, can you provide some more details on that? Um, it sounds like there's going to be a fire control demonstration, but um, what what is this? Where where is this architecture headed um, in terms of developing this? Where are you going with this? <laughs> um, it's 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 a hard one. Uh, we stay very close to uh, NORAD and Northcom on what their needs are and the driving requirements uh, for the capability. Uh, I would say that the trade space is still within the department on uh, how fast we're going to move uh, against what defended assets and what critical assets. So there's a lot of homework uh, to be done. Uh, our job is to lay down the technical architecture options. Uh, and work that within the department uh, to see what we can do. Uh, it is a real threat. Uh, if you talk to General Van Herc, uh, he is concerned about it. Uh, we stay very close to him. And, uh, and, and of course, uh, we're working that uh, through the department. You'll, you'll see uh, dollars in our budget to continue to work the architecture and those options. That, that's why the dollars are in the 23 budget. That's for the capital area here. That's for the Washington, D.C. Uh, it's, it's, it's a broader threat problem uh, for the United States writ large. And so that's, that's what we're looking at. We're looking at the bigger problem. Then you have to kind of narrow that down to to what the sites would be, and, and then we, we go from there. But we're going to do a demonstration, you know, for some small area, um, and so that's that's where we'll go. We, we are defended today uh, in the national capital region with the capabilities that we have. It's about the evolving threat as it always is, and we want to make sure that we're ready for that. Thank you. Yes, sir. And we're going to go to the back to Zoom line, and Jason Sherman, you have the honor of having the last question of the uh, evening. Please go ahead. Uh, Admiral, I wonder if you could say if you see the Guam system as a one-off, uh, whether it's, you know, or there's potential around the corner for that to be used in other parts of the world. And I had a question also earlier about the missile defense review. Can you say um, how this budget you're proposing um, changes course in any way from what you had been doing, the department had been doing up till now, uh, as a result of the missile defense review? No, I don't see anything about uh, layered homeland defense. Uh, it seems to be gone. Any other uh, initiatives um, taken on or uh, jettisoned in this budget as a result of the de defense review? Thank you. 
Uh, well, uh, Jason, thanks. Uh, well, you know, the missile defense review hasn't been uh, released yet, so I, I can't really speak to it. It's, it's more of a policy document anyways. It's it's not, uh, I mean, I, I participate uh, in, the, in the crafting of it, but uh, in the end, it'll be policy in the department that releases that review. I don't see any big swings. Uh, it's still always about uh, integrated deterrence and uh, having a credible defense as a part of that. Uh, so I'm, I'm not seeing any, any big swings there. Now, to answer uh, your, your Guam question about it being a one-off, um, absolutely not. Um, I think that what we do on Guam will inform what we do for cruise missile defense of the homeland, for example. Uh, we are using uh, existing uh, sensor technology. We're going to tie in through command and control battle management into space assets and other uh, sensing uh, capability to have our fuse track uh, there. Uh, so that uh, we're going to be using, uh, you know, different launching systems and uh, different missile capability that uh, exist today uh, that are in a constant state of evolution. So I think we're going to deliver a really great uh, capability on Guam and absolutely it will be extensible. It's not a one-off. What makes it may feel like that is if you've ever been on Guam, the topology of the island, and Mark loves it when I use big words like topology, it is a tough place. So, you know, an Aegis Ashore site uh, is limited in what it can do because of the, the rise and the fall of the hills. And, you know, you've got radar, uh, you know, it's not a flat earth, and it's certainly not flat on Guam. So uh, we've done uh, some really incredible work and analysis over the last couple of years, and by dispersing the systems and uh, you know making sure everything's networked, um, uh, we're, we're going to do something great there, and it will be extensible to, to other areas as the department needs it to be. And that brings us to the end of our time for uh, today, guys. Thank you all so much for uh, sticking around so late and uh, for your interest in missile defense. Thanks again, and have a great night. Admiral?